everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here today on the first episode of Femme Founders Live, um, a bi-weekly live event that you know, we'll be having um, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and our YouTube channel. So this is our very first episode, and um, I'm like, I'm really excited. And with me today is Jeremy. Um, Jeremy is the vice president of um, recruitment at Robert Alf. And so Jeremy, do you want to tell us a little about yourself and what you do? Sure, so pleased to meet you. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited, a um, little bit nervous. You know, I've done this before, <laughs> but not too many. So I'm, uh, you know, 99% excited, 1% nervous, but um, I work in the Bay Area of California. Um, so I'm a recruiter. I help people find jobs specifically in finance and accounting. Um, I'm even more specifically uh, permanent. Uh, we, we have another division that's contract. I'm permanent. And so all day long, I'm either talking to employers to help them find top talent or talking to job seekers looking for a great new job and then helping with all the minutia in between that matching and helping um, helping people uh, join new opportunities. Interesting, interesting. And I mean, with the way things have been since COVID happened to now, how has it been for you as a recruiter? What, what has the experience been like for you? I, if, from a recruiting perspective, it's been interesting because even I myself, I used to be in the office every day, uh, all five days and, you know, wearing... <laughs> Um, not not quite a full suit, but almost a suit every day going into the yeah. office now. Um, while I came into the office today uh, for this conversation, I'm typically at home every day now. And that kind of mirrors what the candidate market is like, too. So mm -hmm. it's um, things are rapidly changing. Um, it's a whole different market and a whole different job market, candidate market, employer market than it was before the pandemic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like, you know, both for candidates and employers, a lot has changed, you know, and everyone is just trying to like wrap their heads around it. They are. You know? Yeah. And it's, it's not just changing, but conti just continuing to change. And yeah. you know, I don't even know what, what the future will be. Maybe it'll continue going as it is. Maybe it'll change. We'll see. But I'd say the biggest, the biggest differences are it's moving faster especially mm -hmm. on the candidate side, there's so many more jobs. And, and admittedly, admittedly, I know the San Francisco Bay Area of California better than nationally or globally. You know, so what's happening here might not be happening everywhere. But there's yeah. so, many, so many opportunities and employers need to act quickly if they want to land the top talent or else they're going to go somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's why we're having this conversation, right? Uh, you know, Financial Sense is an accounting practice management software for mm -hmm. accountants and bookkeepers. And we recently carried out a survey. We asked of over 180 firm owners what some of their biggest challenges are. And, you know, over 30% of them talked about, you know, the fact that they've been having trouble getting good or great staff great employees and especially when it comes to like remote employees and all mm -hmm. it's like everyone wants a fully remote job or at least right you know an hybrid job so it's difficult everywhere and that's why we're having this conversation and i'm really excited about all the things i know you're going to share with us today so me too thanks again for having me thank you thank you for um accepting our invitation so and I know we've, we've talked a little about this, but in your opinion, what are some like recent hiring trends, especially in the finance and accounting industry? Sorry, you, you cut out for a moment. Recent, you said recent changes. What yeah. Is, so what are some recent? Sure. Yeah. So I think the biggest one is uh, the candidate market, the, the job applicant. We call them candidates, but you know yeah. the, the employer, <laughs> uh, the, the employee market. There's so many more opportunities, mm -hmm. so it's so much more competitive. Um, so you 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 have to make your opportunity stand out against all of the op other opportunities. Also, you've got candidates wanting more and more remote, or at the very least hybrid. You know, say yeah. 50, 50 50 or some percentage breakdown of home versus in office. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then a lot of employers are now in the last few months really wanting employees to come back into the office, um, which is which is tricky because candidates aren't wanting to do that. You know, whether it's COVID or otherwise, they're just not wanting to do it. And I'm noticing that a fair amount of employers are not moving quick enough to respond to the fast market on the candidate side. You know, yeah. they're, they're they're acting like they were from a hiring perspective pre-pandemic, and they're mm -hmm. they're losing out. Uh, they're not moving swift enough to yeah. capture the talent. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's I think it's it's understandable, really. You know, especially for the finance and accounting industry, it looks like you know an industry where people have to be in the office to work. You know, they are really busy. They have they have so much to do, and they are dealing with very delicate, you know, matters. We're talking about money, people's sure. money. So you know, the idea of having your employees distributed across different time zones or different countries actually sounds scary. So I think one of the I think one of the best things any business, including accounting and you know bookkeeping um, firm owners can do is to actually retain their current employees. Mm -hmm. Do you have do you agree with that? And what do you think about like employee retention and what firms can do in that regard? Sure. No employee retention is huge because the you know in short the, the better you retain the less you have to recruit, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously recruiting is important, but you'll have to do it a lot less if you can retain them in the first place. Plus, mm -hmm. they'll refer their friends and family and loved ones to work there as well because it's such a great place. So yeah, that would be ideal. Um, but I'd say, so retention super important. Um, I mean, whatever your business is, whether you make donuts or build houses or plumbing or whatever the, the company does, you really want to focus as much energy and time and money and resources on that, whatever your core business is. So any recruit, I mean, obviously I'm, I love recruiting. I am a recruiter, <laughs> Yeah. but, but if I owned a business, any, any effort put into recruiting would take me away from my core, my core business. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and it's tough because even if you already have an employee, let alone are looking to hire one, they can be, um, not stolen, but they can be uh, taken away by another company with a better opportunity. So you always yeah. have to be on guard to make your company an opportunity, the best opportunity, both when they're hired, when they're being interviewed, hired, mm -hmm. and then the whole time they're working there, that that's the best opportunity for whatever they're looking for. Um, mm. Because otherwise there's so many opportunities that they can choose Out from. There. Yeah. And they're 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 just leaving sometimes not even with two weeks' notice and they just ghost their employees and go elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I mean, so let's talk directly to like accounting, bookkeeping, mm -hmm. CPA firm owners. As a recruiter, you know, as someone that deals with candidates and employers. What are some practical tips, you know, firm owners can use to like retain their current employees? What are some incentives, some strategies that they can just put in place to ensure that their best brains don't go stem? Sure. So, I mean, the short answer is it's all case by case because every okay. every candidate and applicant is different. Mm -hmm. I would say I would say what I've heard from my candidate. So. I've been with the company um, a little over five years, about five and a half. Um, I've met somewhere between 13 and 1400 uh, candidates in that time. And wow. what I've heard mostly from what, what candidates are looking for, um, and admittedly a lot of them were pre-pandemic, right? About mm -hmm. a third of them were since the pandemic. But you've got, I want a growth potential. I want something that's mentally challenging, mentally stimulating learning mm -hmm. opportunities, skill set expansion. Um, I want a, a positive, supportive manager. I don't want to be micromanaged or treated poorly by my manager. Yeah. Um, and then recently, as, as I already mentioned, is commute. Um, I'll say, it's funny, my first three years as a recruiter, the, big, the first question I got was always, how much does this job pay? Now, <laughs> and, and you, you, would, you would think that that would still be the, the first question I'd get now. But recently, mm -hmm. it's it's been is this remote or if wow. not remote, is it hybrid? And then after we clear that up, okay, how much does it pay? Wow. Yeah. Um, and I can show something 
if my computer will cooperate here. <laughs> um, I put up uh, now, I mean, this is a super small sample size, but I put up a poll on LinkedIn. I'm just looking for it now. Let me see if I can share my screen one second. This might be interesting. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Let me <laughs> did, that, did that work? It should be. Yeah. Okay. So now again, it's a, it's a small sample size. We're only talking about 50 people. Um, but this was a poll I put up um, yesterday. And so I asked the question, and Tosin, you can see my screen, correct? Yeah, okay. definitely, yeah. So I posed, the, I posed the question, why would you leave your job? I mean, now this is more hypothetical than anything, but it's interesting. The 50 people replied, um, as you can see, the, the leadership, you know, how positive and cheerful and supportive is the leadership. Um, mm -hmm. Expectations, you know, that's a big part of it is eliminating surprises, right? And finding out what, what an applicant expects in a job, both in the day-to-day, -day, but also in the long-term. Yeah. Um, and then having growth and meaningful work. And then if you're wondering why I picked those four, it's actually, there, there was an article I read uh, yesterday, which is linked um, below, um, which you should see from uh, Yahoo Finance. And they listed those as the top four the top four reasons of why people are leaving jobs lately. Um, I would personally add in the remote hybrid, uh, definitely. Yeah. But, um, in my experience, but those are those are four ones I hear pretty frequently too. Hmm. Wow, that's 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 interesting, really. And I feel like you know employers are actually going to like you know as small and medium sized firm owners, you know. Sometimes they might feel just, they might just feel like, okay, what exactly do I do? Like, how do I go about getting these kind of people? Um, you know, some, some of them are moving from solo businesses to building mm -hmm. their own team. So it's their first time managing people. Uh, so the question is, what are some of your tips for firm owners, you know, to become that employer that candidates want to work with? Okay. And you're talking about like, how do you manage a remote workforce or how do you attract top talent to you? Yeah. So I would, I would say we should start with how, how to attract them, you know, before sure. we start talking about retaining them, the first thing is sure, sure. bringing them in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously you've got the big ones of, is it remote? Is it hybrid? And hybrid, when I say hybrid, I mean, potentially they can work one day a week remote, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four. Mm -hmm. um, then you've also got flex scheduling, which is different, where maybe the day could start anywhere from 8 a.m. to 6 a.m., 10 a.m. Um, pay. Pay is a big one, of course, as always. Uh, benefits. Benefits are highly important. Um, I know some or a fair amount of smaller to mid-sized companies, they can't always compete on the pay side. So exactly. a lot of that, yeah, that's the story. They can't just pull money from the magic tree, you know. Yeah. So um a lot of that can be culture, the people, um, the fit. Something that I do, and this relates to your question, something I do when I meet with every new job seeker and they give me some time and we talk about what they're looking for, you know, we not only talk about the pay and the title and things like that, but really more deeply, especially from an intangible perspective, what's what do they most value? What are they looking for? For example, it could be, you know, I've met people where it's, hey, I want stability job stability, right? I want something consistent. I want um, great benefits and I want a positive culture. You know, I don't need growth. I don't need to be too challenged. You know, I, I, I want to have a positive culture and stability. I meet other people where, hey, I'll work 60 plus hours a week, you know, but I expect rapid growth. I expect promotions over the next few years. Um, everybody's different, right? So, if you can determine what, I mean, this is of course, after you've talked with them, you know, usually in the interview, right? But yeah. um, I would try to get a deeper understanding of what they're really looking for. You know, not mm -hmm. just, is this candidate a fit for our line item requirements and mm -hmm. responsibilities, but does it fit what they're really looking for? Because if if the role's not a fit, say you've got the the growth profile versus the job stability profile. If, yeah. you, if, if they get hired in the wrong job, or some place that's not a fit, they're probably not going to stay, right? Mm. So really determining the level of fit up front. Um, 
But yeah, definitely with smaller organizations, the, the culture is inc incredibly important. So have them meet people, make sure that they get along. A lot of your future success in a, in a job as either an employee or even as a manager is going to be dictated by how much you like and get along with your colleagues. So Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. I think that's um, very, very insightful and practical, really. And so my next question is, OK, so let's say, you know, you've as a, as a founder, as a firm founder, mm -hmm you've had an interview or a couple of interview sessions with a candidate and you've gotten to understand what matters to them. So how do you marry what matters to you as an organization with what matters to the candidates? Because really, as a firm founder, as the, as a, as the owner of a business, you know, there's something you want to achieve. You also want to employ someone that, you know, will be able to do the job. Mm -hmm. we'll, be able to, we'll be able to work remotely and be effective, you know. Sure. Those, are some of, those are some of the things that you have on your list of requirements. So how do you marry what the candidates want and what your firm needs? Does that make sense? Yeah, and there's no, there's no magic bullet. I think it's, it's I mean, again, assert, originally ascertaining what they're looking for, initially making sure just at the very beginning, is this even a good fit or not? And sometimes yeah. it isn't. You know, you, you don't marry every person that you go on a date with, right? Yeah. Um, and each each date you go on, you learn more about what you're looking for in a partner. Same thing with work and jobs. Um, so I would just have a continuous dialogue. I mean, it doesn't have to be every day, of course, but an open mm -hmm. door, continuous dialogue, you know, especially if they're working remotely, I would check in with them, um, you know, once a month, once every couple months, once a quarter, what have you. And just, you know, realign on that, you know, hey, is this still what you're looking for? Are, are we still meeting your your needs? Are we meeting your expectations? Have your expectations or your needs changed? You know, if so, is there anything that we can do as your employer to help lessen the gap from expectation to reality? Um, maybe, maybe you can, maybe you can't. It depends on the scenario, you know, and it depends how drastically their needs have changed. Um, you know, if you can change something great, you can keep them and retain them. If not, you can help them find, a, um, another opportunity either in your organization or even help them network to find an opportunity outside of the organization, which is counterintuitive. I know no company, why would I help somebody get a job elsewhere? But in the long run, it'll only help your brand. If people know that you always have their best interests at heart all the time, um, and then as far as, I, I believe you also asked about managing, kind of managing and getting great productivity from a remote workforce. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, you know, again, there's no magic bullet there either, but I would say the same things you would look for in an employee that's going to work in person, um, you would look for those same qualities um, for someone that you're going to hire remotely. I would put an added emphasis definitely on computer savviness, technology savviness, you know, maybe ask them during the interview, I'd ask questions like, hey, last time you had an IT or a computer problem, what did you do? You know, did you immediately call IT or were you able to sort of troubleshoot the problem on your own? Right. Because a lot of times, I mean, they're out working where, you know, wherever they live with no physical oversight other than video check ins. So you want someone who can really handle any problem that arises. Um, I would also really dig into the references. I would ask for references early and I would, I would ask detailed questions and I would explain, hey, this is a remote role, right? How do you think they'd work remotely? Have they ever yeah. worked remote? Have they ever worked remotely in the past? If mm -hmm. they haven't, have they worked independently or with little supervision on a project? Mm -hmm. How did they do? Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how responsive are they? How, how quick, uh, uh, you know, how long do they take to reply on things? And do they meet deadlines? Typically, if they're doing those things effectively, they should be a, a good remote employee. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so let's, let's circle back to the, the mm -hmm. poll you did, the poll you did yesterday and, you know, the response, the responses you got to the poll. Now, um, I think one of the, one of the things that candidates look out for or even after they're employed, one of the things that you know employees 
you know, consider very important is that they are able to, they have like a good work-life balance, right? They are not overburdened with work. Work does not eat into other areas of their lives. Um, work, work is shared equally among mm -hmm. teammates. Okay, now, so I'll just chip in and you know, speak directly to founders. Um, when you have like a distributed team, one of the most important things you need to do is to be able to like ensure that everyone is working and one person is not working more than the other. So you don't have one member of the team doing four people's work while someone else on the team is practically doing nothing. And that's one of the things, one of the problems you can solve with financial sense. Uh, with our team communication feature, you can actually see who is working on what. You can see who is overworking and who is not working enough and then distributes tasks to them such that everyone has something they're working on and every member of the team is able to see what the other person is working on and be able to align properly. You know, like you said earlier, Jeremy, at the end of the day, people have different things that matter to them. But I would say that, I would argue that most people just want to be able to have a life outside of mm -hmm. work. They want to feel valued at work. They want to feel like one person is not doing less than I am and probably earning more than I am. Then, you know, these are all like little things, like intricacies that you need to be careful about as a mm -hmm. firm owner. So do you want to I say agree. anything? Yeah. Do you want to say anything about like, managing teams now you know as a firm owner as you know because as a recruiter i'm sure you've had conversations with people leaving their current jobs and they're talking to you and they're telling you why have you had you know situations where they told you that they, they were leaving their jobs because they felt like they did not have a life outside of work have you ever oh absolutely had... absolutely especially i mean I, i've heard that in all sorts of industries especially in public accounting Right with yeah. the tax tax season, accounting season. busy season, yeah. auditing, yeah. et cetera. Uh, but even outside of public accounting or or bookkeeping, mm -hmm. third party bookkeeping, I've I've heard that for sure. Um, I'd say probably half the people I meet are are of the mindset that the work life balance is really really important to them. The other mm -hmm. half being ones that are maybe willing to sacrifice some of the work life balance to get that career growth, but. Um, Work-life balance is huge. I mean, and, yeah. and, if, and and even the people that go for the growth, you know, the, the they want to climb the ladder really fast. They can get burned out. A lot of them, two to three years in, they're burned out. And then they even they mm -hmm. flip over to wanting work-life balance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You have to enjoy I, your life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes um, the stage a candidate is in their life actually determines what they're looking for, like, for someone that is straight out of school, you know, you might not care so much about work-life balance. It just wants, you know, a well-paying job and, you know, growth potential. But someone who has probably has a, has a family, you know, they have other things that are important to them. Their priorities are different from someone who is probably single, just out of school and trying to just start out their careers so in interviewing candidates you probably also have to look at like what stage of life the candidates is in because that would definitely determine what is most important to them right now all right so um i wanted us to just talk a little more about like retaining employees because sure. like the, t the title of this live is how to hire and retain employees um so Based on your experience, right, working with employers, like connecting and connecting candidates to jobs, right, what are some of the characteristics of, you know, employees that stay in jobs for long, like loyal employees and, you know, employees that are not even thinking about leaving their job anytime soon, simply because they're enjoying working there? Sure. I mean, it's... It depends if you're asking at the resume stage versus when you've already met them, right? But I'd say if you're looking at, if you're asking about the resume stage, you know, people typically act in the future the way they have done in the past, right? We're, most of us are creatures of habit. So if you look at the resume, 
and you see too much. Um, did I just hit the mute button? Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, sorry. I thought I hit. I thought I hit the mute button. Um, you can look at their resume, and I mean, each hiring manager will determine in their own mind how much job movement and how frequent movement they're comfortable with. But I'd say if it's a if it if the movement is more frequent than you're comfortable with, but you still feel their background's worth invest you know learning about, I would talk to them and really try to dig deeper and ask ask the motivations of why they left each one. You know, I'd ask things like, were they contracts? Were they permanent roles? If they're permanent, why did they leave? You know, was it a resignation? Were they fired? Was it a layoff? If they resigned, why? If they were fired, why? Right. And then especially if you see a number of resignations, right, then that plus every movement every one or two years to a new job or new company, that would definitely be a, a red flag if you're looking for someone that's that's stable, you know. But you can also ask them just straight up, you know, when you think of your next employer, how long do you envision being with them? And nobody can predict the future, right? But you'll get you'll get some good information that way too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I like the fact I like I like that you said, you know, just come out straight and ask them because mm -hmm. there are definitely unique situations that you know that might make someone change jobs like frequently and all that. So it's sure. important. Or life yeah. events, you know, maybe maybe the yeah. the company the company moves, the 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 candidate moves, maybe the yeah. someone in their family got very sick or what have you. There's always um I can't think of the word, but there's always outliers that, that make yeah. sense. Yeah, absolutely. And then earlier you talked about how, you know, small and medium-sized firms cannot compete mm -hmm. with larger organizations in terms of like salaries and all that. And we all know that, you know, right now the job market is really tough. Yesterday, over a thousand people were laid off in one of the big tech companies in, here in Canada. And almost every week on LinkedIn, people are actually announcing that they lost their jobs and all that. So, um, I mean, how can small and medium-sized firms like really make use of this opportunity? Like, how can they? How do I put? How do I put it now? How can? How can they face this? Wow. Okay, one minute. I lost you for a minute, Jeremy. Sorry about that. I can, I can still hear you the whole time, but uh, I think, yeah. sorry about that. Internet no connection. Worries. No worries. Welcome back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So how can, how can the smaller organizations take yeah. advantage of, if a larger company has a layoff, how yeah. can they take advantage? Yeah. So, I mean, again, I think it comes back to, to fit. I mean, as far as the, the volume, I mean, there's, okay, there's volume of how many people you can touch base with and connect with. Um, so you can look on LinkedIn or read the news articles and see who's who's which companies are being laid off, and then reach out, especially on LinkedIn specifically, to those candidates. Um, um, and then once you once you get their attention and you're talking with them, it really comes back to the fit um, and learning what they're looking for. Does our opportunity uh, fit what they're looking for? And then if if the conversation's going well, you know they're progressing through the rounds of interviews but they have a concern like, ah, I, I don't think we're going to be able to compete with what they were earning, right? And we can't compete with other companies ne necessarily on pay. So one thing would be benefits. I would try to get as strong of a benefits package as you can. Um, I would, if possible, it's not always possible, but if possible, try to customize the benefits for whatever's important to that person. Maybe for them, it's sick pay. See if you can mm -hmm. increase this. Maybe it's vacation time. That's a big one yeah. for smaller companies. Instead of two weeks, maybe you can do three or four. Or if, if you have to start at two and then it's scheduled to go to three at year five, maybe you can bump that up to where it goes to three weeks at year two, right? Yeah. Little things like that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's um, the, the, the culture's, a, again, a huge part, which you can't, you can't really change your culture overnight. But that... Yeah. I mentioned that though, because it, you know, if you peel the onion back, it, it goes back again to hiring. I mean, the way you get a great culture is by hiring excellently in the first place. So uh, yeah. not just hiring this specific person, but all the people you hired before, especially the managers and the leaders 
are you hiring people with um, with the right culture? Um, and then just doing everything you can, whether they're looking for stability or learning or growth, um, you know, maybe you can throw them more tasks. If you can, promote them, if you can, if you can't promote them, you could probably give them more tasks and responsibilities that would make them feel like, hey, I'm learning new things and contributing in new ways. Absolutely. I love, I love what you said about how, at the end of the day, culture is a function of the people on your team. So it still goes back to like Definitely. hiring. It's a, it's a big circle. It's a, it's a never ending yeah. circle. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So do you have some tips about, I know you've already touched on some of those things, mm -hmm. but if, I mean, if there's any firm founder listening in and wondering, okay, what is a great culture and how do I build one? You know, I know it's not something, like you said, it's not something you do overnight, but like I also mentioned earlier, some of our, you know, some of our customers, some of our community members are moving from like a solo firm to building a team. And they actually want to build great teams with great culture. So Jeremy, do you have some tips on how to build a great work culture that candidates can recognize from outside and want to be a part of? Jeremy, are you here? Uh oh. Uh. <laughs> Welcome back. Sorry, internet. Uh, it, I haven't had these problems before. So I heard everything you said. Um, what and I was saying it's it's not an overnight process. It's a long term process. But I would. Um, I mean, if, if you really go from the start. I mean, first, if your company doesn't have a mission or a vision statement, I definitely create that. I think that gives you the blueprint of where you should go, especially culturally. Mm -hmm. um, and then think of what, what core personality or intangible tenants are the most important to your organization. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I would try to include something in the, in the interview process, um, whether it's a, a cup of coffee or maybe a, a brief lunch or even just a, if it's an in-person meeting, you know, take them on a tour around the office, you know, or even if it's just phone or video, you can still spend a few minutes to get to know the person on a personal level. You know, what kind of, what kind of things do they like doing in their off time? Uh, what, what enthuses them? You know, why are they, um, if they worked for this company, how would that benefit their life on a personal level? You know I mean? So it's a lot of little things. There's not one specific um, large thing per se, um, but I think if you stitch it all together and if you really make sure that each and every single person you're hiring, no matter their title or level or role, fits the culture, it, it will just tighten the fabric that much more. Yeah, I, I, agree, with, I agree with you on that. Very true. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I just want to say to those listening in, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the comments. We'll be rounding up now. So it's time for you to like, drop any questions you, you have. <laughs> um, yeah, so back to you, Jeremy. Um, thank you so much. I think I've, I've actually learned a lot. And I know that those, you know, listening and those who watch later will, you know, get all the, all the tips that you shared. Um, so is there any other thing you would like to add about, you know, how firms can hire and manage remote teams? Sure. Um, I'd say as far, as far as the hiring, I mean, that's really my, my expertise um, more than the managing per se, but yeah. I think some real practical things that would help, especially from being a recruiter. I mean, this is what I do all day. I help navigate the process from um, posting a job to seeing which candidates are a fit and then everything from there through uh, their first day on the new job, you know? So I think if you're, if you're um, an employee, an owner of a small to mid-sized business, I'd really focus on, recognizing that the candidate market truly is not just overwhelmed with tons of opportunities, um, but it, it, it's moving so quickly because of that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in my in my day-to-day -day business, I've lost candidates that I've been working on with opportunities with my clients to other opportunities, right? They'll yeah. call me, hey, I found something else, you know, or, or I didn't find something else. My current company um, promoted me. My current company just gave me more money. My current company, I was only looking because 
Um, I wanted more work-life balance. They just cut my hours or, or you know, well, they, yeah. they eliminated my overtime or they let me work from home one day a week or what have you. So um, a couple things I would do is I would, um, once you find a resume of someone you like, I would reach out to them right away to schedule the interview. I wouldn't, I would try to eliminate any unnecessary delays. So yeah. contact, contact them right away. Um, once you get in touch with them, get the interview scheduled as soon as possible, ideally mm -hmm. within 24 to 36 hours uh, or 24 to 48 hours, I should say. Um, and then between each round of interviews, depending how many rounds of interviews you have, I would mm -hmm. shorten that process as much as possible too. You know, you really don't want to go much more than two or three days, ideally just one or two days between each round of interviews. And then at the final interview, same thing, make your decision. I don't want to, and it's not a matter of rushing, right? It's just once you identify that the kid, because when you first meet them, you don't know, you're, you're, you're getting to know them. Yeah. Once, you've ident once you've identified, hey, this candidate could potentially be the one or be, you know, close to the one, I would switch from intervie interviewing them to selling them on your opportunity, right? So it, it's a, and it's a subtle, but it's a dramatic mental switch. Um, and, uh, and then when you make your offer, and, and mm -hmm. I know this is a lot of, I know this is a lot of detail here, but this is what I, what I do all day long. Mm -hmm. um, you want to come in at least at what they're asking for. If they're looking for 80K, if anything less than 80 is potentially going to rub them the wrong way and you're risking them not accepting. So if you can afford the 80 or 85 even, I mean, imagine how much more excited you're going to be at 85 if 80 is your expectation than 75, right? Yeah. If, if that's your expectation. Um, and then if they accept you know, through the whole process between acceptance date, whenever they accept, and then the start date, I'd really stay in close, close contact with them. Because again, counter offers, multiple offers, people changing their mind, etc. You, you got to really stay in touch with them much more than you used to. Wow. Yeah, like, <laughs> so true, so true, so true. I feel like, I mean, it's not about rushing the process. That's not, that's not the idea. The idea is not to rush the process. The idea is once you recognize that this, is, this candidate is going to be a great fit for your company, you actually go for it, like go for it and mm -hmm. try, to, try to meet them where they want to be, like in terms of the kind of offer they want. I totally agree with that. And, you know, sometimes it might be difficult to like meet them within their salary expectations again because we are talking to small and medium-sized friends I, but I believe that there are certain benefits you can also use to woo them you know you can reduce their work hours you can mm -hmm. make the role hybrid do you want to say yep. do you want to add more to that more vacation time more that's vacation a big time. one I, I've, yeah. I've helped I've helped place several people in the last year where with their their vacation plan as is it probably would not have it was most likely not going to have been accepted but by adding just one extra week or if not that then making it so that it it elevates usually it's a tiered one week and then over years of service so if you can throw extra vacation time at them um, you can bump up the timeline of the first review which would then mm -hmm. give a chance to, if someone thinks that maybe the starting salary is a little bit low and their review wouldn't be for a year, maybe bump the review up to six months out or three months out. Mm -hmm. um, as sick time, holidays, you know, yeah. some people love getting their, getting their, their birthday off, you know, off work. Um, yeah. I've heard of <laughs> every other, maybe every other Friday, they get off two hours early. You know, every yeah. little thing, every little thing helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, oh, it's okay. Well, yeah, I agree. Like, there are so many ways you can actually. There are so many benefits out there. Mm -hmm. You can also include things like you know maybe a learning budget. So you pay for a course or certification that you sure. take once every quarter or once mm -hmm. a year or something. There are so many things that are important. Again, I think it goes back to like. You know, getting to know the getting to know your employees or getting to know your candidates, you know, at the initial stage, 
and knowing what is important to them. For some people, mm -hmm. they want to be able to like take courses and certifications and know that the company is going to sort it out for them. Because I mean, mm -hmm. what they are what they are learning is going to affect the job they do anyway. So yeah, Absolutely. the options. Yeah, the options are actually quite many. You just need to like mm -hmm. get to understand what is important to your sure. candidates and of course what you can afford because you definitely don't want to overpromise and then you can't True. afford it. <laughs> yep, because then that, that expectation gap would get bigger. Yeah. yeah. One other thing, especially since your clients are smaller to mid sized firms, um, pe typically people that are attracted to working for a smaller to mid sized firm. And I know I've said culture like a million times today, but um, <laughs> but little like, um, and it depends if they're in the office versus remote. But you know, f free donuts on Friday. You know, maybe yeah. the company maybe the company gets takeout once a month, and they get a free meal once a month. You know, mm -hmm. which which depending on how many employees you have, could be a hundred or two hundred dollars, but it would make the, them feel so valued and appreciated, right? little things yeah. like that or if it's if it's remote um you know little playing a virtual um like a board game board game uh night or not night but you know at any yeah. point virtual social, right? social yeah yeah you social know you can go on zoom you know zoom or teams or whatever and do a little social event yeah you don't yeah. have to be in person to do social stuff so yeah 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 i totally agree with you i mean yesterday we had a social event um internally at financial sense and it was great we got to know you know one another better and it was Absolutely. fun we, we yeah. loved a lot and you know and then you find out you, you know members of your team that are very competitive and you know just laugh about it so yeah absolutely um mm -hmm. people want people want to be able to work with people they enjoy working with people they know people that you know um, appreciate them and that they appreciate so, i mean i feel like Jeremy, you shared so many insightful tips and, you know, I'm so glad you, you came for, you know. Oh, my pleasure. Thank us. you so much I'm for so having glad. me. And I, I hope, um, uh, you know, I, I know all of those tips won't apply to every single person yeah. listening, but, ho but hopefully every person that's listening was able to grab a couple nuggets from this. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure they at least got one or two things. Um, I feel like, you know, it's been a very great time. So thank you very much, Jeremy. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us for the next one that will be happening in two weeks time. And the next topic is about pricing and it's going to be really, really interesting. So hope you follow us and, you know, turn on your notification so you don't miss the next one. Once again, thank you, Jeremy, for joining us. And everyone, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.